Today we're beginning a new message series which I've called Prayerful Living. And in this series we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer in what I believe is a new and a fresh way. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, many of us have it memorized. It's, it's actually not a prayer simply to be repeated over and over again. In fact, Jesus told us, he warned us against praying prayers by rote. Memorizing a prayer and repeating it over and over again, thinking the more times we say it, the more likely God is to answer that prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. It's an outline prayer. It teaches us the important things to pray for. And yet the Lord's Prayer doesn't just teach us about prayer. It also teaches us about our priorities in life. And so it teaches us about prayer and life. The very things that we pray for are the same things that ought to be priorities in our lives. And so what we pray for in our quiet time are the same things that God wants us to live out in the rest of our lives. And so today our first message in this series, Prayerful Living, is called Loving God as Father. And so the Lord's Prayer begins in Matthew 9, verse 6, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so God intends us to view him as our Father. The Father not just of me, the Lord's Prayer doesn't begin my Father, it's our Father, the Father of all God's children, the Father of everyone in his family, all believers. And our Father exists in another realm, another realm called heaven. He's not here on this earth. We can't see him with our eyes. He's spirit, not flesh and blood. And so Jesus teaches us to address God as our Father. Now, what is our Father in heaven like? How do we learn about what he's like? For many of us, our concept of our Heavenly Father has been formed by our relationship with our earthly father. If our natural father was a believer, if he was a godly father, then it helps us in understanding what our Heavenly Father is like. But if our natural father was not a godly man, or perhaps he was completely absent from our lives, then, then it's more difficult to understand what our heavenly father is like. And yet, even if our earthly father was not present, God still can be a father to us. Psalm 68 verse 5 says, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. A father to the fatherless. He wants to be a father of everyone even those that didn't know an earthly father. And as believers, we need to see God, our father, as he truly is, not through the lens of our natural father. Because no matter how godly our fathers were in this life, they were still not perfect. They still had their faults. And so we need to see him, our heavenly father, as he truly is. John 4.24 says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And so our concept, our concepts of God as our Father need to be informed by the truth of God's word, not on our experience with our natural fathers. And so this morning, I pray that we would all have our eyes open to see God as our heavenly Father, as he truly is. And as we see him in truth, we can grow in our relationship with him as his child. So how can we see God as our heavenly father? People have all kinds of views of God. Some people view him as a distant creator. He created everything and he just lets it run. He stands back in the distance and everything ticks on. Other people see God as a vengeful God. He's sitting up in heaven. He's just looking to see if you mess up today. And if you do, whack, he's going to hit you a vengeful father in heaven. And yet others see God as expecting perfection in his children to live life in a perfect fashion. And if you don't, watch out. But God wants, to see, God wants us to see him as our heavenly father. He's a heavenly father to every believer in Jesus Christ. And he, through his spirit, assures his children of who he is. Romans 8 I just remind you in your bulletin, there's a white page. You can take that out. It has the scriptures and the outline written out there for you. Romans 8 says, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit 
that we are God's children. And so every believer has the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Spirit of God living inside of them. The Holy Spirit here is called the Spirit of Sonship, or in some translations, the Spirit of Adoption. And so we who are believers here today have been adopted into God's family. We become His children. And through that Spirit, we can call our Father Abba, which was the uh, language of that day saying, Daddy, to intimately relate to our Heavenly Father. And that same Spirit, the Spirit of God, assures us that we are God's children. And so this morning, listen to what the Spirit is saying to you about your Heavenly Father. If you listen closely, you'll hear Him say, You are my child. I love you. I am your Heavenly Father. I want what's best for you. I want you to have the assurance that you are mine, that you are saved, that you are my child. Each and every day of your life. Your Father cares all about you. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And so Jesus is saying if the sparrow's life, the most common bird, not worth practically anything, if the life of all the sparrows are held in God's hand, your Father's hand, and He knows, keeps an eye on every sparrow, how much more is your life in God's hand as you are one of God's very own children and so much more valuable than the sparrows? Your days are numbered by God. You are protected by your Father. He knows all about you down to the very number of hairs on your head, which decrease each and every day. <laughs> you are very valuable to Him, and He cares about every aspect of your life. Some people think, some people say, I think there's songs, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Have you heard people say that? And maybe no other human being does but your Heavenly Father knows what you're going through. He knows what you've gone through in the past, what you're going through now, what you're going to face tomorrow. And not only does He know about it, He cares about you. And He will take care of you. And since He cares about you, you can ask your Father for His good gifts. Jesus taught us in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? And so Jesus here in this passage is comparing our natural fathers with our heavenly Father. Now in comparison to our heavenly Father, our earthly fathers were evil. Even the most godly of them, right? They sinned, they did things wrong, they didn't raise us completely right. But even those earthly fathers, they know how to give good gifts to their children. They know how to take care of their children. What earthly father would not give to his children the things that they needed in life? The food they needed, the shelter they needed. Every earthly father would want to do that for his children. And how much more will our heavenly father give good gifts to his children? The gifts they need in life. Our Heavenly Father not only has the desire to give these good gifts, He has the power to do it. And how can we receive God's good gifts? The gifts that our Heavenly Father has. What do we have to do? They ask. He'll give good gifts to those who ask Him. We ask in faith. We believe that He loves us. We believe He cares for us. And we ask Him... Not for the things that we want, but the, for the things that we need to do the things that he's asking us to in life. And so prayer is an important part of seeing God as our Heavenly Father. It's in prayer that we request our Father's good gifts. And when we receive them, we can thank him for that. If we don't pray, if we don't ask him, we're not going to receive what he has for us. Now let's think again about how the Lord's Prayer begins. Our Father in heaven. 
It begins with addressing our Father. It begins with worshiping Him. Acknowledging who He is. Addressing God by His most loving and intimate name. But Jesus didn't begin the Lord's Prayer by saying, Almighty God, did He? He didn't begin the Lord's Prayer by praying to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He didn't begin the Lord's Prayer by saying, we pray to the Captain of the House of the Lord or the Creator of the Universe. We pray our Father in heaven. And so our prayers begin, should begin with worship, not petition. And as we grow in seeing God for who He is, a loving Heavenly Father, our faith is going to grow to ask of Him the good gifts that He has planned to give us. And what are these good gifts that God has for us, that our Heavenly Father has for us? Well, these are everything that we need to carry out God's plan and purpose for our life. Everything you need to accomplish God's will in your life, God has for you. It's a good gift. And all you need to do is ask and accept it by faith. So not only must we see God accurately as our Heavenly Father, we must also understand our Father's authority. God is a loving Father, and yet He also has great authority. If you had a father who loved you, but he had no power to give you good gifts, it wouldn't help much, would it? But not only do we see God as our father, we must understand his authority. Your father has absolute power. I don't know if you did this when you were a kid. You say, my dad can beat your dad up. Anybody <laughs> You know, because he's bigger, he's badder, and you boasted about your father. Well, our Heavenly Father has absolute power. I mean, there is nobody who's a match for him. And he is your father, and you are his child. First Timothy 6 says, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and and might forever. Amen. So our Father, your Father, if you're a believer here today, is the only ruler. He is the Lord of all earthly lords. He is the King of all earthly kings. All other authorities in the world are underneath Him, are under His authority and power. And our earthly fathers pass away, do they not? They don't live forever, but your Father in heaven is eternal. He's never going to die. He lives in unapproachable light. Nobody can threaten him, attack him. He is to be honored. He's to be worshipped forever and ever. Our natural fathers had all kinds of limitations. Limitations to their power. Limitations to their authority. Limitations to their resources. Limitations to their love but not our Heavenly Father. He has absolute power. And because of His absolute power, we must fear your Father alone. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. When Jesus was speaking to His disciples in this verse. And so often we get this backwards. We fear people... And what they may do to us, but we don't fear our Father. And Jesus tells us here we should have no fear of other people. They can only do us bodily harm. They cannot do anything to our souls. They cannot do anything to our relationship with God. No one can separate us from the love of God if we're believers. But rather we must fear and be afraid of our Father. Because his authority extends to destroying both soul and body in hell. In other words, we must fear and obey our Heavenly Father because our eternal destiny rides on our relationship with him. We love him and we fear him. And that is 
the essence of wisdom. We must fear God alone. If we fear God our Father, we need have no fear of anything or anyone else. Now, why is understanding our Father's authority important? Well, two reasons. The first reason is that nothing is impossible for Him. Sometimes we just say that, but that needs to sink down into our hearts. Nothing is impossible for our Heavenly Father. He can meet every need that you have. He can provide for everything that His children need. And when we truly understand his power, when we truly understand his authority, when we understand that nothing is impossible for him, we can ask in faith because he can deliver anything that we ask in Jesus' name. The second reason that understanding our Father's authority is important is that it causes us to fear him. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To fear God is the beginning of wisdom. If we don't fear God, we don't have wisdom. We're not going to live life in a wise way according to God's plans and purposes. Fear of God is what helps us to keep pleasing Him and to avoid displeasing Him. If we have no fear of God, we're not going to care whether we displease our Father or not. But if we understand who He is, the power He has, the authority He has, that fear of God will keep us pleasing Him. And through His power, your Heavenly Father can give you everything that you need to serve Him. He will help you to obey Him. He will teach you everything you need to know. He will teach you to pray according to His will. He will give you the courage. He will give you the boldness to be an effective witness for Him. Everything you need in life, He has. He can give you because of His great authority and power. And so how can we grow in understanding our Father's authority and power? Well, first of all, by reading and believing God's Word, the Bible. God has revealed to us what He is like, how He has acted in the past, how He's going to act in the future. And as we understand and believe the things written down, our faith and understanding of His authority grows. And as we grow in understanding the Father's, our Father's authority, we can also grow in knowing our Father's holiness. What does holy mean? It's used a lot in the Bible. We don't use it a lot in everyday conversation, do we? Holy means to be set apart as sacred and pure. God is holy. He's set apart as sacred and pure. To be holy is not to have any trace of wickedness or evil. God has no trace of wickedness or evil. God's holiness is based on the fact he is, he is totally other than His creation. We have everything God has created, including you and me, and then there is the Creator over here. He is totally other than His creation. He is infinitely above mankind, who is the pinnacle of God's creation. He is holy. And we are to seek for everyone, for all to honor God as holy. Let's look at the first phrase in the Lord's Prayer again. This is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. And when we pray, hallowed be your name, we are asking God to help us to honor God as holy. To honor Him in all of our lives as holy it says, hallowed be your name. The name of God refers to his reputation. That his name would be honored in our lives. And so when you honor God as holy, what does that mean? It means that you always speak of his character and his actions as being totally righteous. You never blame or accuse God of evil. That's not honoring him as holy. You never blame or accuse God of doing any wrongdoing. He is holy. He's incapable of doing anything wrong. Everything he does is just. Everything he does is righteous. Everything he does is loving. And when we pray, hallowed be your name, not only are we praying for ourselves to honor God as holy, we are praying for and committing our lives to showing and helping other people to understand God's holiness. We are praying that God's name would be honored as, as holy among other people. 
but people around us. And how does that happen as people commit their lives to Jesus Christ? They begin to understand that they must honor their Heavenly Father as holy and worship Him as holy. Revelation 4 verse 8 gives us a glimpse into what's going on in heaven. It says, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, what are they saying in heaven? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, in another message, we're going to discuss another phrase in the Lord's Prayer, and it, which goes, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what we see in heaven, we want to happen on this earth. God's will is being done perfectly in heaven. In heaven, there is no sin, there is no evil, there is no devil. And in this verse, what do we see going on in heaven, in this perfect place? We see God's will being done in heaven. He's continually being worshipped as, as holy. In the Bible, when something is repeated, it's repeated for emphasis. Here, it's holy is repeated three times, triply emphasizing the importance of God's holiness. He's the Lord God Almighty. There's no one equal to Him who was, who is, and who is to come. He's always existed. There's never been a time when God did not exist. In fact, he exists outside of time, if you could comprehend that. He exists now. He will always exist. He's eternal. And through his son, Jesus Christ, we can have eternal life. Do you understand what that means? Eternal life means that we can exist with our Father forever. We can live with Him forever and ever. And so not only does your Father have all authority, he is, he is holy. God's holiness means that His power and His authority will always be used in justice and righteousness. You know, with human rulers, we're always concerned that if they get too much power, what do we say? Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? But God has absolute power. And he exercises it in love and in justice. Every time, all the time. God's holiness means that he's loving and good in all his ways. And so as a holy father, what does God want? He wants his family to grow. He wants to have more and more holy children. And how does God's family increase? How does he have more and more children? God's family increases as each of his children obeys their father and tells others about his son Jesus. That's how it works. God's family increases when another rebel surrenders their life to Jesus Christ. Every person who does not know God as their heavenly father is a rebel. They've sinned, they've rebelled against God. And when they surrender their life to God by putting their trust in Jesus Christ, God's family adds another child. And our Heavenly Father's family of children grows. And so you and I have an essential role to play in the increase of God's family. And so as we pray, hallowed be your name, we are praying that God's name would be honored as holy by more and more people. And so we must be praying for lost people to see God as holy. That's what hallowed be your name means. That's what we're praying for. And so here's one way to pray for people you know who have not yet become believers, who do not yet honor God's name as holy. First of all, pray for their problems to lead them to Jesus. People who are not yet believers have problems in their lives. And those problems are designed 
for them to look for help from God. Pray for their problems to lead them to Jesus. Next, pray for their refusal to believe in Jesus to be overcome. Every unbeliever, usually in this country, is refusing to believe in Jesus. They have some knowledge of him, but they're refusing to submit their lives to him for one reason or another. Pray that that rebellion, that that refusal is overcome. Next, ask. Ask for God to draw them to himself through the Holy Spirit to begin to draw their hearts to him, that he would reveal himself to them. And finally, what is your part to play? Obey God as you tell them about Jesus. God's going to speak to you what part you have to play in drawing them to himself. Invite somebody to church. Talk to them about Jesus. Share something that God is doing in your life. You have a part to play in expanding the family of your heavenly father. And as your friend becomes a believer, they will honor God's name as holy, as you do. There will be an answer to your prayer, hallowed be your name. And so today we've begun a, a new look at the Lord's Prayer, a guide to prayer and a guide to life. We begin by seeing God as our Heavenly Father. He cares about you. He wants to give you good gifts. Not only is God your Father loving, but He also has all authority. He has all power. And we must fear Him alone. We must submit our lives to Him. He's holy. We must worship Him as holy and seek to add new children to His family by encouraging others to honor Him as holy as, as well as they believe in Jesus Christ. And all we do and all we say, we are to love God as our Heavenly Father. Your action plan for the week is at the bottom of your outline. First of all, continue to have a quiet time of Bible reading, prayer, writing down what God is saying to you. I'd encourage you this week, along with your other Bible reading, to read Matthew 6, 1 to 15. It includes teaching of Jesus and, on prayer, including the Lord's Prayer. I encourage you to read that and pray over that. Secondly, use the Lord's Prayer as an outline in your prayer life. I don't mean just repeat it over and over again. You know, Pastor Dean, I prayed the Lord's Prayer 50 times this week. No, I'm saying use it as an outline. We've kind of explain the first line. You can kind of figure out, you know, give us today our daily bread. You're not just praying for a loaf of bread. You're praying for your needs of the day. And you flesh that out. You use it as an outline. We'll talk more about that as we go through the series. And finally... Invite your friends, relatives, neighbors, workmates to our Easter service next Sunday. You have an a, uh, invite card in your bulletin. You've seen two ways in the video of how to do it. And you can pick which way. I don't know if you should play darts or not. <laughs> but uh, depends if they have a dog around. So invite friends, relatives, neighbors, workmates to the Easter service next Sunday. Easter is a Sunday for whatever reason, that many people who don't usually go to church are open to going to church. And so it's a good time to invite, pray and invite. This morning, if you're not sure that you're a believer, if you're not sure that God is your heavenly Father, I want to give you an opportunity to pray with me so that you can be sure that you are a child of God. God wants you to know that He is your Father and you are His child, that you're going to heaven to become a child of our Heavenly Father, we need to admit that we've done wrong things, that we've sinned. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. He rose from the dead. Invite Him into your heart. Commit your life to Him as your Lord. And so we're going to pray that simple prayer. And we'd like to ask you to bow your heads right now. If you haven't prayed a prayer like this before, if you're not sure that God is your Heavenly Father, if you're not sure that you're going to heaven, I'd encourage you to pray with me. Say something like this. Father, today I admit I've done wrong things in my life. I've sinned. I've been living life my own way. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. 
took the punishment for our my sins that I might be forgiven. Come into my life. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he's alive today. I commit my life to following him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for making me your child. And for those of us who are believers today, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father. Thank you that you always care about us, that you always care about me as your child. And may I love you in return. May I ask you for the good gifts that you have for me. May I not refuse any good gifts that you have for me and think that I know better. May I earnestly desire every good gift that you have. Help me to understand your authority and your power. And may I seek to expand your family by helping others put their faith in Jesus Christ. Give me opportunities this week to invite people to the Easter service next Sunday. And at that service, God, we pray that you would speak to each and every person and draw them to yourself. We pray, God, that you would draw people in many different ways to hear the truth about your resurrection, about Jesus Christ, the one who is alive today, the Lord of lords and King of kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.